greetings and salutations, YouTube. Sorry I've been away for so long, I've just moved house. Okay, so this is another monster video, and uh, as promised, this is going to be the Dow. This is the last of the Genie videos, so it's going to be lengthy as I'm going to be covering um, some of the other lesser known forms of Genie. Well, one in particular, and also just briefly touching on the Genazi. So the Dao live in the Great Dismal Delve. This is a, a massive area of rock do uh, dominant elemental place in the elemental chaos. Or if you're um, of the old planar cosmology, in the plane of Earth they occupy a distinct area called the Great Dismal Delve, which is a massive area larger than most continents on worlds which is surrounded by and suffused by mazes of uh, complex rockwork and massive structures, basically dungeon world. It's a continent-sized structure built in rock, of rock, with dazzling displays of wealth and architectural wonders, such as flying, over, uh, flying buttresses going across massive chasms, um, huge skyscrapers of, of rock which are going in all sorts of different directions, moving juggernauts, um, all sorts of weird and counterbalanced moving walls and um, places that mimic the clockwork machinery of Mechanis, that sort of thing. So it's it's an architectural wonderland, um, but it's all rock and uh, a lot of metal too. So the Dao are, in physical form, they're much taller, much broader and muscular than human beings. It's, it's impossible for them to pass as a normal human. Although they have the same sort of features, they're just too massive. And uh, But they can disguise themselves uh, magically to appear like a human or a dwarf. And quite often they, um, they operate on the prime material uh, worlds in such a guise because they like to go to the prime material worlds uh, to basically get up to no good. Um, they are neutral evil, and um, they are one of the more malicious of the, uh, of the genies. You don't really want to be in their service because they don't have any value for lesser life forms. Like all genies, they were once mortal souls that bound to uh, the element of Earth and became Dao. They are immortal unless killed, and, and they're inherently magical beings. They... So they, they dwell in the great Dismal Delve, uh, which is ruled over by the Khan, who is basically their emperor. Uh, the position of Khan changes occasionally due to the internal politics of the Dao. And they have inter interconnected through dimensional gateways and portals a huge multi-planar uh, trans-dimensional network of other Dells, other other grottos. So this is areas of rock that they find floating in the elemental chaos, which they mine out and become realms in and of themselves. All the great uh, elemental cysts with uh, geode energy um, in various prime material worlds. So anywhere where they can dominate the area of Earth, mine the resources there, um, and establish kingdoms in and of themselves, these become vassal colonies of the Dell that are basically connected to the Delve through gateways of mazes. So these are ruled over by uh, sort of generals called Atomans, who are overlords, or Hetmans, which are similar. Um, the, the, the distinctions between them are largely distinctions of the Dao, but they're basically the overlords of that particular area. They are ruled over or advised by seneschals, who are basically governors, who uh, conduct the wishes of the Khan and basically give proclamations to the Atomans and Hetmans in their individual realms. At any time, the Khan can call upon these individual realms, and the Atomans and Hetmans are obligated to provide whatever forces, usually military, that the Khan desires. So at the snap of his fingers, the Khan has access to gigantic resources um, of great power. And the realms that the Atomans and Hetmans dominate are many and varied. Some of them specialize in particular types of creatures or resources uh, or pleasures, um, exports, imports, dealings, um, trade networks, machinations. Um, they could have dirt on anybody. Pardon the pun. So the Dao, uh, they're one of the strongest. They've got an armor class of 18, hit points of 187. Uh, speed of 30 feet, they burrow naturally at 30 feet, but they can't take living beings with them because it's, they, they basically they become part of the rock and move through it. And they can fly 
at 30 feet uh, by their lower body turns into a dust storm or a whirling uh, yeah a dust devil they have a strength of 23 and they're renowned for their ability to carry very heavy objects um, in the original article in Dragon Magazine 66 I believe uh, they talk about the Dow's ability to carry very large amounts of weight um, but they will eventually tire out um, yeah and they pretty much remained unchanged all the way through to 5th edition the Dow are one of the one of the few genie kinds that basically were perfect right from the get-go and they haven't really been adjusted very much uh, in the 5th edition they're, they're very similar um, they have uh, dexterity of 12, constitution of 24, intelligence of 12, wisdom of 13, and charisma of 14. They get on reasonably well with the Ifrit because they have a trade connection with them. They rely on the Ifrit uh, to craft materials, raw, raw materials, particularly metals, into very finely worked um, objects of art and utility. And in exchange, they provide the Ifrit with connections across the realms um, and a sort of a mutual arrangement they generally do not like in fact they hate all the other types of genies and they generally don't have anything to do with elementals unless it's exploitive so yeah they and also even more so than their fruit they carry a grudge and if you wrong them they will track you down and take revenge on you slowly painfully it's like a sport for them it's a primary form of, of uh, entertainment uh, they are sure-footed. They have advantage on strength and dexterity saving throws against the effects that would knock them prone because it's the stability of the earth. Uh, they have innate spell casting, along with their um, whatever spells you want to give them from their learning over many, many hundreds and, or even thousands of years. They can innately at will cast detect evil and good, detect magic, stone shape, uh, and three times a day they can use pass wall, move earth, or the tongue spell. And once a day, they can conjure an elemental, earth elementals, uh, use that gaseous form, invisibility, phantasmal killer, plane shift, and wall of stone. They could also originally create a wall of force as well. So if you wanted to give them something like that, fine. Um, or even an illusionary wall, or the ability to disguise themselves or shapeshift. Uh, they would have all sorts of magical um, items on them, particularly something like a big magical hammer, and they'll have all sorts of amulets and diadems and uh, rings and necklaces and bracelets and that sort of thing belts uh, they tend to wear flowing silks um, much like most of the other genies wear wear billowy silky sort of things but they are particularly fond of um, that sort of attire and they model themselves if you think of um, ancient cossacks uh, similar sort of attire and their the way that they um, organize their political structures they have many of the same names and things not sure why, I guess that was just part of Going X's original game. They uh, can glide through the earth, uh, borrowing through non magical, unworked earth and stone, and they don't mis disturb the material that they pass through. So you've got no idea that a, a Dow has passed through that area. There's no disruption of the soil or whatever. And when they die, they disintegrate into a fine crystalline powder. Uh, they typically make two slamming fist attacks, or two attacks with giant maul. Uh, the fist is plus 10 to, to hit uh, and does 15 points of bludgeoning damage. And the maul will also, also plus 10 to hit and takes ooh, the target takes 20 points of bludgeoning damage. And if a target is a huge or smaller creature, must succeed on a DC 18 strength check or be knocked prone, such as the prodigious strength of the Dao. Now, in their homes, um, they have massive amounts of resources of slaves and uh, vassal creatures and servants and things to, to do their bidding and they will send them against you um, suicidally they, don't, they really don't care about any of their servants if, if their skin is at risk um, they will sacrifice everything to protect themselves um, and they have great amounts of physical wealth to pay mercenaries to track you from one end of the universe to the other um, they are particularly malicious and and they're also avaricious so the greed of the Dao is bottomless uh, the wealth of entire worlds is not enough and it's not so much that they value the utility or the power that having money gets you it's just simply having the thing having more than anybody else they're, they're the epitome of greed um, and they often are characterized as laughing tyrants 
who will sit there smugly sprinkling diamond dust across their food, not for any nutritional value, but just for the fact that they can eat wealth. So, yeah. Um, and that's pretty much it for the Dow. They, um, we've also got the Janazi, which I promised to talk about. So the Janazi came about in um, the Planescape setting, and essentially they are mortal beings who are elemental blooded, and in later editions they had a, a, a soul connection to an element, much like the genies, uh, mortal beings who are bound with an element. You could say that Janazi are lesser, lesser forms of that, so they have a spiritual connection to an elemental force, which they can, I, I guess you could say psychically, um, manipulate, and it becomes a part of their metabolism. So they are humanoids, they are living beings, they can die, They can, if you cut them they bleed, but they are also part elemental, so a part of their, their physical nature is made up of elemental force and they can be sustained by it, so they can feed on fire if they're a fire soul or whatever. Um, and they take on physical features of those elements and also mental characteristics of those elements as well, so the fire genasi are particularly mercurial, hot-blooded, quick to anger, quick to cool, uh, the earth genasi are stoic and dour, um, but very solid and reliable, that sort of thing. Um, and I, I found them, I've played numerous Janazi as player characters over the years, and I've always found them particularly fun to play, because I like playing that elemental aspect. And the fact that they are humanoids um, can interact fairly well with other um, mortal species, but they are distinctly alien and very quirky to play. So, yeah. Um, and... They're varied. There's also been um, additional reworkings of them, and um, particularly in uh, 3.5 edition of D&D, when there was a plethora of um, sub-races that were created, there were the para-elemental genasi as well, so you can have the ooze genasis and things like that. Um, so you just basically go into spiraling chasms of weirdness with the genasi when you go down that track, and many of the creatures in 3.5 were quirky. Um, I liked some of them because they, they sort of took you back, harkened back to the original 2nd edition Dungeons and Dragons and some of the weirder creatures from the Fiend Folio, for instance. Um, yeah, and everybody's got a soft spot for weird monsters, I'm sure. Uh, last but not least, we have the Jan. And the, the Jan, or, or Jani, are the weakest of the elemental humanoids, and they combine all the elemental forces. You could say these are kind of the precursor to the Janazi. Um, and one interesting thing with the Jan is because they combine all four elements uh, elements into one, they must spend a, a certain amount of time on the prime material plane. In fact, many of them reside on the prime material plane almost exclusively. Um, so they are creatures of the multiverse, but they are they are genies of the prime material, the combining of those elemental forces. And they often wear chainmail armor, um, and they look very... Um, sort of eastern military, um, mercenary looking. Um, and they can fly. They are neutral good, typically. They're typically tall, but not extremely tall, six to seven feet tall. Um, they are very strong. They have a magical resistance. And uh, much like other genies, they have similar abilities of uh, dark vision out to 120 feet and resistant to elements. Um, the Jan have a lesser resistant to elemental forces, so they can burn, they can drown, um, they can die of cold or heat and things like that, but they're very resistant to it. Um, and very weird, like their metabolisms are strange and magical. And they have, um, yeah... They favour dwelling far away in um, fairly forlorn areas like desert areas or hidden oases um, where they are private and safe. And they will sometimes befriend, befriend humans or work with them for desired rewards, um, typically magical items or something to protect them or provide them with greater freedom of movement. Um, but the society of the Jani is very um, open with males and females regarded as complete equals. Um, they reside in groups of 11 to 30 individuals, and they're a tribe, which is ruled over by a sheik, um, and uh, with one or two viziers, and um, the exceptionally powerful sheiks are known as emirs. Um, so yeah, they're very much the eastern sort of um, model for their, their culture. 
they travel to other elemental planes um, when possible uh, and typically last um, for a while before they at least two days before they start getting hankering back to, to return back to the prime material plane because they're sort of um, sustained by it yeah so mm. they're yeah they 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 very much um, model themselves after the um, the original sort of tribes of uh, the Arabian Peninsula so yeah they're fairly civilized but also um, can become quite fierce enemies and they value their freedom and privacy and that I think about rounds it up so in overview of all of the genie they have a complex um, society of their own they are immortal so their plots and things can range widely and get very involved and can they can drag a lot of um, individuals with them they're quite fond of acting through intermediaries so you may become involved in a genie plot through an agent of an agent of an agent um, but if you strike up upon something at random that the genie has been looking for you may become directly involved with the genie suddenly and unaware of the fact that you're working as part of their network in the beginning so you may be hired on to clear out a mine shaft by a, a dwarven caravan um, and then when you discover an ancient artifact in there you may come to the attention of the genie who was providing the dwarves with raw materials so that they could give it to a vizier um, who was in a league a den of sorcerers who could open up a portal that were channeling it to their fleet secretly it, it can get very involved and all of a sudden you're directly dealing with a doubt and perhaps you don't want to but you know there it is so that's one way that you can involve um, genies in your campaign just suddenly and all of a sudden oh by the way the genie was aware of your activities all along because this is what they do so yeah there are fun elements of the game and um, certainly one that I've enjoyed bringing to you the research of them is maybe delve quite deeply into um, the old lore of Dungeons and Dragons and it's very interesting to see the slight changes that genies have had over the years um, and the fact that the elements and uh, their activities are still part of the game so thanks for listening everybody thanks uh, for putting up with my week of absence and I'll be back to my regular update, uh, updating next week <laughs>